Um, yeah, uh, they were asked me to give a talk this morning a little bit of what we've seen in our animals over the years, how we've changed. And, you know, the more we do this, folks, uh, it comes back to, you know, we are dealing with nature every day. And um, we were really big into, you know, this is the way we were going to do things. And we were imposing our will. This is the way it's going to happen. And we were going broke. Um, and we found out, you know, there's a saying, and I won't say where I read it, but it is being enforced today across the United States. It goes like this. Nothing in nature is given. It is one. W-O-N. That's what we're teaching young people today, coming into egg. We've got to get a bigger weapon, uh, a bigger piece of equipment, you know, meaner herbicide, whatever. And if we don't fight Mother Nature at every breath, she will kick our butt. And we, we, were down, we, were, we were that apostle. We were doing that. And it wasn't working very well for us. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've changed in, the, in what we've seen with our animals. And this thing doesn't want to move, so I can do that. Uh, our past grazing practices, we were a continuous grazing. So, you know, we, we did the Columbus method. You all have heard of the Columbus method. You, you know, you turn your cows out in the spring and you discover them in the fall. Um, <laughs> that's, that's what a lot of people do. I mean, around us, that's what people are doing. They got one big farm or one farm, may not be a big farm. And they, I feel sorry for the animals because they're never moved. Can you imagine living in this room your whole life and never getting to move out of it? And having to make a living? And raise a calf and get fat and breed back? No, it doesn't work that way. But we were doing that and there was zero profit at the end of the year and we were almost bankrupt and things were not good <clears throat> for us. Um, and so we, that's a good sign right there. Uh, can you all tell which one is uh, controlled grazing and which one's continuous? <laughs> Folks, the, the person on the right, that's 100 acres, and they're running about 16 cows on there. But they're never moved, ever, ever. We're running 300. At that time, we had about 380 in there. And look at the grass we've got there. But they're only there for 12 hours on a strip, then we move them. And so we're basically duplicating what the bison did on the prairie for thousands of years, and what we're finding out is we can make more profit. Folks, profit is not a dirty word. And for us to be on the farm, you know, there's an old saying, before you know, we can change the world, we have to save ourselves. Did you all realize that? What we mean by that, when you're changing the world, is we're using the animals to heal the landscape. We're tramping a lot of litter on the ground. We're defecating, urinating, and then we're moving on and letting the plants recover. That's all fine. But if we lose animal performance while we're doing that, because we took our eyes off the animal, we go broke. And that's because the animals don't breed back. Folks, the biggest cost or the biggest risk you have in a livestock operation is the cow that doesn't breed back. I don't know if you all are familiar with that, but you've got to keep that in mind. Those cows have got to breed back or you're out of business, period. You know, you can buy a bred cow today for uh, $1,500 to $1,800 for a good one. Uh, an open cow is six to $700. That happens in one growing season. You lost over $1,000. Not a good way to stay on the land. So in 1993, we switched to MIG. We were continuously grazing. And we went to MIG, which is Management Intensive Grazing. We were rotating the animals around our farm. We put them in a paddock for two days, two days, two days, two days, and we were watching the calendar. We weren't watching the land. We weren't watching the plants. We weren't watching the animals. We were just on this set rotation. And in 2006, I heard a guy from Africa, uh, Ian Mitchell Ennis, you'll hear me talk about him a little bit today. Ian was doing this high density grazing in South Africa, and uh, he was talking about you know, the animals increasing you know, the, the, the production on his land and how the soils on his farm now are like walking on peat moss. And I said, well, how much fertilizer did you put down? You know, how much lime? And he goes, well, in Africa, we don't have those kind of things. Uh, you know, hey, they don't feed any hay over there. And so he uses the animals. And what he was focusing on is trampling and leaving, trampling some of this forage on the ground. And we've seen a big increase in plant diversity when we switch. So what we're doing is we're increasing 
the number of animals on an area, but we're, we're moving them more frequently, okay? And by doing that, we've seen some change in the way they act. So, you know, with our current grazing method, it's managed planned grazing. Uh, we're doing daily monitoring now. We're, we're monitoring what's happening on the land. And I think we're all can get so close to our farms that this is the way it was done, that we lose sight of the big picture of what's happening in front of us every day. And that's what's kind of challenging about this type of grazing is we do need to watch what's happening. I just had a guy call me on the way to this conference yesterday. He's like, great. He's in Missouri. He goes, my God, he said, what are you doing about the mud? And I'm like, what do you mean? I said, well, it's muddy. My cows are just tearing my pastures up. I said, so you got to move them. You know, don't get stuck in this, I'm a high density grazer because it's wintertime. Uh-uh. You got to spread them out. You got to move them. You got to have plans. You got, you know, if you're short on feed, you should have had the hay already placed around your farm where you're going to need it in the wintertime. Don't be after traps and hay around your farm you're going to make ruts. We don't make ruts on our farm. Absolutely not. We're not going to do that. We're not going to make ruts because the ruts are forever. Uh, so profit. Profit's a big one. And, you know, this, this sustainable word, we're using that a lot. Uh, I think it's overused, especially in my case where we have these old worn out farms. Folks, we get farms that nobody wants. They're absentee landowners. And so we've got uh, 16 farms today. 12 of them are leased. Those farms that we got leased are farms that were bankrupt by people haying them, taking the hay off and not putting anything back. And what they turned to is broom sedge. Okay, so I inherited a broom sedge farm, and I'm saying, I'm sustainable. Well, what's so great about sustaining a broom sedge farm? No, we, we want to be that bottom word. We want to be regenerative, and we can't. We can build soil, we can build profit, we can build animal numbers, and we don't have to break the bank to do it. It does take management. So we've got these landscapes. This is a farm that I'm pretty, pretty uh, proud of. That was my uncle's farm. And he got killed in 1967. And when he got killed, that was all in big blue stem. And my relatives inherited that farm. I was only seven years old when he got killed. No, I was eight. And uh, so it's, it grew up in eastern red cedar and thorn trees. But folks, I didn't have a tractor when I bought that farm. I just cut those off, and we, we got rid of the brush, and we started grazing it correctly. There's never been any lime put down on that. And guess what came back? The big blue. Folks, there's never been a seeding done that can do as well as what nature puts there. Okay? Those perennial warm season plants, seeds, were in that seed bank, but they couldn't express themselves because of all the cedar and all the brush. You know, nature was trying to take that back to old growth timber. That's what will happen. If you don't do anything to land, it will revert back to timber someday. It may take a thousand years. But it will go back to timber in our area. Maybe not where you don't get any rainfall. Uh, yeah, in Tucson. So the animal behavior has changed. And part of that's been because of the human exposure. We don't have any flighty animals in our herd. You have got to be the predator. What I mean by that is you will never have a good non-flighty herd unless you are the predator. Take them out. If you all are my herd, and I walk down through here, and one of y'all raise your head and jump up and take off running, I'm going to get rid of you. <laughs> You're not going to be allowed to propagate in my herd, because you just told me you don't want to live here. And you also told me you're not going to get pregnant. You also told me you're not going to get fat. Folks, get rid of them, and don't name them. <laughs> If you name your animals, you're not going to get rid of them. I'll go one step further. Don't register them. A registered animal's got a paper on it. You're not going to get rid of her. When I mean, she needs to go, she needs to go. So we have lower stress, the docility. You know, we're selling grass-fed meat. And when you have a stressed animal its whole life, 
That's going to be a tough eating experience. You want an animal that's relaxed. Okay? If they're always stressed up, you don't want that. And they're hard to handle. They're going to run through your fence. They're going to make the rest of your animals kind of stupid. And here's the worst thing, folks. What if you kept a flighty cow and she had this really beautiful bull calf? I mean, he's a beaut. Looks like, he looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger when he gets grown, okay? Beautiful animal, masculine. You're like, I'm going to use him. Now you've put that bull over your whole herd. What have you got? A bunch of flighty calves. And now you're going backwards. It may take years to fix that. Uh, and we're also seeing increased animal performance. When an animal is relaxed, all they care about is eating, drinking, relaxing, and propagating. That's just natural. There's no stress. There's uh, clean grass. It's a good, clean forage every day. They, they do well. And if your animals do well, guess what? Your bottom line does well. Our animals have to be able to take children. We have a lot of people come onto our farm, and uh, we had the grass-fed exchange at our farm three years ago. And there was about 300 people in that tour, and they walked through our, we had a cow herd out there, they're all together, and the, the cattle were out there, and the bulls were in there. And there were some ladies go, Greg, you got bulls in there. And 50 bulls. I'm like, okay, yeah, what's the issue? Well, we got kids. They were scared that those bulls, you know, you think about a bull, it's going to charge and you'll be mean. And I reassured her, I said, there's not a bull in there that's going to lift up his head and even look at you. And that's because of the way we, we treat our animals. Um, you know, they need, to, they need to be chilled and friendly. And that's what I like about this type of farming, folks. It is child friendly. Um, we don't have a lot of moving parts as far as mechanical. There's not, you're not going to lose your kid to a drive shaft. You know, cows, sheep, pigs, they're all pretty friendly animals when they're treated correctly. Um, you know, that's what we're doing. So we're taking, you might say, a, a grass, and with our management, we're turning that into money. We're grass manipulators. That's what we are. And, you know, I used to call myself a grass farmer, and Ian just scoffed at me. He said, you're not a grass farmer. I'm like, what do you mean? He said, you're a microbe farmer. So he's taking it one step lower. Folks, if we, if we grow the soil and have healthy microbial populations in our soil, we're going to have healthy livestock. But if you've got crap soil and you're trying to grow grass-fed beef on it, it's not going to work. You've got to fix the soil. You've got to fix the soil. You can't expect to have quality animals on junk land. So it does take some tools. And you know we're running a lot of land. Um, we just started uh, a new intern yesterday. Um, he's out of the Navy. He's been in the Navy for 20 years. Him and his wife and three kids moved on to our farm. And they want to have their own grass-fed operation someday. And I'm just tickled to help a vet. You know, him and his wife are both in the Navy. Anyway, he, he helped us put up paddocks yesterday. And he came back at lunch. And I mean, the guy was just brimming. He was just so excited. But it is a practice that is learned. And it does help to have the right tools uh, when you go out and do this type of thing. And that's all part of stuff that you can learn. Um, and then we use the tools to do different things. Here we're working on some civil pasture where we went in and taken out the trees, the junk trees. And we've left some of the nicer oaks and hickories. And we bring the cattle in there. And those cattle are stocked and they're pretty tight. That's a million pounds. What I mean by that, there's a million pounds of beef on one acre. But they're only there for five minutes. Okay, <laughs> don't forget that. <laughs> you can put animals in real tight and use them like a bulldozer. So what we're doing is we're breaking down multi-rose bushes, sprouts, all the stuff Kathy's talking about. When they leave, there's nothing left. They've trampled it. But we only did that for five minutes. Well, we did it for two hours. J Jacob and I stayed with those cows, and every five minutes we moved them, and so we used them as a tool to beat this stuff on the ground. And what came back was. Pretty impressive. So you can use them as a tool. Um, I think we need to get the, the townspeople. These are some girls. These are actually from St. Louis. Uh, they're writing an article on the farm. And they wanted to come out, and they'd never been in around a chicken. We put them in the layers, and they freaked out because the, the chicken started pecking on their pants. I mean, that, that gal on the left, look at her. She is freaked. She thinks she's going to be eaten whole by chickens. 
And finally, I just grabbed her and I held her and I said, just close your eyes and listen. And all you could hear was this brr, brr, and all the chickens, were, she said, it sounds like a melody, it sounds like a chorus. They're all so happy to see us. And she's like, this is relaxing. But she needed, you know, she had to have that, that security to say it's going to be okay. And I think our consumers think that we, you know, all the meat comes out the back of the store in the package or the eggs or whatever. They're coming out of that carton. We need to get our customers and the townspeople more out on the land and get them educated. Again, we need animals that are safe, animals that are friendly, and those are the kind of animals, folks, that'll make you a living. They're out there, we can find them, and you need to propagate those type of animals. I'll go a little bit further. Um, I think we've got our animals, especially on the cow side, we've got the animals too big, folks. If you're gonna try and do this with forage, you gotta remember, the hardest thing in the world the hardest thing in the world to get off of grass is energy, milk. We don't want our beef cows given a lot of milk. Now, I know that goes versus maybe what you all have been taught or heard. We're not in the dairy industry in the beef cattle business. We don't want a cow that gives a lot of milk because if you have a cow that gives a lot of milk, she's not going to look like that. She's going to be taller. She's going to be thinner at the end of the, and you can tell your cows, you can tell which cows give the most milk in March. And that's because we haven't weaned a calf for 13 years. We let our cows wean the calves. So that cow's wintering that calf on her back all winter long. Instead of being weaned in September, October, she has to take that calf through the winter and have another one. By March 1st, the cows that are heavy milkers, they're thin. They need to go to town. Okay. A cow that gives a lot of milk is not going to breed back. She's given everything she's got to that calf. She's sacrificing her body, and she needs to leave because that's going to be high maintenance. We don't want that. So we've got to figure out how to get the right animals that can eat forage and turn that to cash. Okay? That's what keeps us our farm payments. That's what makes us give money so we can send our kids to school or whatever, or college. We've got to have those type of animals. I love poly braid, uh, temporary post. Folks, if you're going to just get started, please don't go out and put in a whole lot of paddocks on your farm. I did that. And that's what I love about our internship program. Uh, I had a young guy from uh, Twin Cities. He'd never been on a farm before. He had an English major. He had a master's degree in English. And Jake came out and he, we had 30 paddocks on the Judy farm, 30 permanent paddocks. And he looked at that, and, he, and after about two or three months, he said, Greg, why do you got all these wires going everywhere? I'm like, well, you got to have paddocks. you got to have a way to hold the cattle. So you've got these reels. Why do you got all these permanent paddocks? And every paddock we had had a gate on it. And guess what happened at every gate? When you've got 200 head, what happens at a gate? Mud. They just destroy it. And so I said, Jake, go for it. He rolled up every dang wire on that farm except for the feeder wires. I had to stop him because I thought he was gonna roll up the perimeter fence too. <laughs> and, but it's been the best thing that's ever happened. So I give kudos to Jake. Young people that aren't raised on a farm have a different way of thinking than we do. And, and I embrace that. I told the guy yesterday when we started, I said, look, I want your thoughts. I don't want you just to be a laborer. I want your thoughts. When you see things that on the farm that aren't Maybe kosher, maybe we could do it a different way. I want to hear that. We need input from other people. And that's the neat thing about having farm tours. How many of you all belong to a farm group where you have farm tours on your farms? Great. Do you all get something from that? Yep. I don't think we can network enough. You, can get, you can't build too many contacts today. But with this, see, we, we're moving those cows to another farm. We've already grazed that. We're leaving, okay? Some people look at that, well, great, it looks like it's ready to graze. No, it's not. It's not ready to graze. So we're moving them through there. They're not going to graze that because they're, they can keep moving forward. As long as the cow can move forward, they'll go here to Kansas City <laughs> before they grab a bite of grass, as long as they can go forward, okay? So it's another tool that allows us to move our animals where we need them. Uh, we've got the hair sheep and the guardian dogs. Um, in our area, we can't have sheep. 
unless you have a way to protect them. And so a sheep can't outrun, it can't butt, it can't kick, and it can't bite. And so if you're going to have something out there that's defenseless, you've got to have a sheep out there that's got fangs. <laughs> and that's what those are. Those are white sheep with fangs, okay? If you come into my sheep flock, you're, gonna, you're not going to want to do that. Um, they're not going to bite you, but they're going to feel like they're going to bite you. And that's what you want. You, you want them to show intimidation, but you don't want a dog that'll bite somebody. Because folks, you're liable for that. Um, there's a terrible, terrible thing happened in Colorado. A rancher had his place posted, and they went on his farm. And, yeah, the dog bit him, and now he's being sued. Uh, people say that sheep, you know, can't, uh, you can't build soil with sheep because they're not a big animal. In other words, they can't trample a lot like a cow can. I'm like, oh, is that right? Okay. Well, sheep, because of the way they graze, they move a lot. They're always moving. They, they graze kind of like a deer. You know, they're more of a, they're more of a browser almost. And they, a cow will stand there and just rip, rip, and then take a couple steps, rip, rip. A sheep, they're, they're very nervous, and they're, they're just constantly moving. And so we've actually been doing some strip grazing with the sheep. Where we're moving them now with one poly braid. We started with three, then we're down to two, then we went down to one. And with one poly braid, we can control those sheep. And so we're doing it in strips. This is in the growing season. And even winter stockpile, we've been doing that. And those darn sheep, because you have a long, narrow rectangle, they will go up and down that strip, you know, for a day. We usually move them about every day and a half. And they trample. They trample a lot of forage on the ground, which is good. You know, you're getting a lot of organic matter placed back on the land where it'll grow you more grass. Uh, one of the things that I want you all to remember is for every grass blade that you can get a cow to trample on the ground, you get two back. So if Kathy gave me a dollar and I put it in my bank, and at the end of the year I gave her her dollar back, plus she kept the original dollar in my bank, she got 100% return. That's a good investment. It's the same way of grass. So when they trample on the ground, I used to think that was waste. Uh-uh. That's interest. That's a deposit. That's a deposit. And you're going to draw some interest off of that. OK? Cattle are 70% water. Don't make them drink brackish water. And we have found the cattle when they come in to drink, they need to put their head in drink. They don't need to be licking at the water. If your cows are licking at your water, you've got bacteria in there. You need to fix that. They shouldn't be licking at the water. They need to be drinking it. Okay. This is another one of our farms that we've developed some savannah on. We're finding in the summertime, you know, when it's 95 degrees and in Missouri, you know, we can get up 85, 90% humidity. Y'all you all in Missouri know what I'm talking about. It's miserable. Well, if it's that hot, here's what gets you. This is what gets animals. When an animal's guts can't cool down at night from the extreme heat in the daytime, and they've got to start the next day with an elevated body temperature, that's when they start losing condition. They may not even breed back. They're going to lose weight, probably. They're not going to graze very well. But if they've got some trees that they can graze through, I mean, there's feed in there. They're comfortable. We're excited about civil pasture. We're developing more and more of it each year. And I tell you what, um, everybody has a little wood lot on their farm. Maybe it's brush. Well, you're not getting much return on that brush. Maybe you could get some grazing days out of that. And that's what we're excited about, is making more of that on our farm. Um, we like portable water when we can use it. Uh, some of our farms do have pressurized water on them. If you've got pressurized water, you don't need a big tank. That little tank right there is 60 gallons. It's watering 300 head of animals. 300 head on 60 gallons. Now, people say, but Greg, it's not very big. Keep a predator over it. Don't just set it out in your passion and let them stomp on that hose. Keep a predator. That's my predator. That's a hot wire. It's got 8,000 volts in it. When my cows drink, they are ladies. They don't fight. Because <laughs> right. they fight, one of them's going to get shocked. Uh, another, I show those sidewalls. That's a sidewall out of earth-moving tire, big rubber strips on each side. 
Folks, that is priceless in this time of year right now. When it's really puggy out there, what's the cow do when she drinks? She picks her head up and looks around, and water dribbles out right there around the tank. Well, within 12 hours, they're standing in the muck that deep. You've ruined that passion for that year, maybe two years. With those darn rubbers, they don't do that. Their feet stand on that big, thick piece of rubber, and that's moved to the next water location. Okay, Just some little tricks that we've learned. <clears throat> so with our planned grazing results, we are now feeding less hay, no seeding, no fertilizer, no lime, and I was able to quit my job in 2009, which was, that was a benchmark that I'd set, and it felt pretty good. Um, you know, we need to be aware of our surroundings. Nature is static. Things are changing daily. And I'll give you an idea, like for winter stockpile, um, we had... Um, we had some really good stock power going along grazing. The cows are doing perfect. They're leaving about three to four inches residual. And then it got down to 10 below that night. I walked out to move the cows the next morning. We already had a strip set up about the same size. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I mean, those cows had taken that whole paddock that they were on and ate it down to the ground. The only thing they didn't eat was the, was the forage under a manure pad. And they even grazed around the edge of those manure pads. Now, if I'd just been blankly giving them, so I immediately rolled that wire up that I was going to give them and moved it over and gave them almost twice as much. Watch that. The, you know, when the temperatures drop, they're going to eat more. See, that's all stuff you've got to pick up. And that's the stuff that will make you successful. That's just a fat animal. I like fat animals. You know, that's grass, folks. People say, well, what do you get for your beef? It doesn't matter what you get for your beef. It doesn't. It matters what you got in it. Remember that. For us to get a major portion of this beef market, we can't expect to sell our beef for $20 a pound and gain 30% of the market. It's got to be affordable. But we can do that with lowering our inputs. If you don't have a lot invested in your meat, you don't have to have as much for it. So this is what we've been doing. With the plan grazing, we're grazing recovered plants and making sure they're grown back before we graze them again. And we're just taking the tips off, and then we move. So we're grazing the top third. We're finding out the plants recover faster, and our animals are getting tremendous fertility, per, per, tremendous forage and gain. So with management nature, you've got to remember one species support eight additional ones. And we like to see diversity out there, a lot more diversity. That's exciting. We're monitoring life. We want to see these. When you go out in your pasture in the morning, in the, in the growing season, look out across your pasture. It should be spider webs everywhere. If you don't have any spider webs, you don't have any soil life. You need to fix that. You need to fix that. You've got to get some soil life out there. This is a new farm, 50 years no livestock. Folks, I would have thrown a match on that 20 years ago to get rid of that duff, and then I went out and put on my seed and cost a lot of money. Maybe I burned my neighbor's barn down. <laughs> it's scary to light a match on that. Folks, remember this. There's nothing wrong with fire as a tool, but just remember, burning promotes plant spacing. Your plants get further apart with burning. Grazing promotes plant density. It brings them closer together. So I've got all that carbon. Why would I want to throw a match on it? Poof, there it went up in the atmosphere. I can use cattle to trample that and feed my soil micros and my earthworms, and now I'm off and going. Don't burn it. Bring your animals in. Trample it. Get it on the ground. <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful picture? Folks, that was one of those broom sedge farms. It's a 50-acre farm. We ended up buying it, and it's, just, it's one of our best farms to date, and that's because we've done that. We put the litter down. That's litter that they trampled on the ground. And then we left. We didn't let them eat that. We just let them trample it. There's building soil. So we're taking, that's our first step, putting in our wire. That's what it looks like after we graze. That's what it looks like pre right after they left. And there it is four weeks later. Look at the clovers coming up in there. Just beautiful stuff. <clears throat> There's good soil, folks. You've got to have that. Learn... How many of y'all keep a spade in your pickup truck or on your four-wheeler? You ought to do that. Get, get accustomed to going out there and just digging up some dirt. Look at you and smell it. Look at it. See if there's worms in it. There's our neighbor. 
he doesn't want his soil, so I'm going to take it. This is my soil here. This is my water coming off my land, and he's a crop farmer. It was grass. He, divert, he, he converted the whole thing to crop. Well, what's happening to his farm? It's going down to the Mississippi Delta. I'm keeping mine. So look at the water coming off your farm in a major rainstorm. That'll tell you how good a job you're doing holding on to your water. We're holding the soil. That's a riparian area that is grazed. High density, short duration. There's what we're seeing. We counted 460, 462 earthworms and one manure pile. Can you imagine? That's a lot of life. Leftover stockpile. So the, the brown stuff you see here would have been stockpile that's left over from the previous fall. And now this is growing up in the spring, and that's what our cows get to graze. So it's a perfect. It's just perfect. No wormy, no fertilizer, predator friendly. We do not shoot predators anymore. Uh-uh. You shoot a predator on my farm, I'm going to start losing livestock. Don't shoot the predators. There's our sheep. Regenerative. We've got to get young people back on the land. And folks, if you've got an established farm, get some young people out there. Get an internship program. Um, there's our conclusions. No, de no stress daily moves. High animal performance. Salad bar every day. Get rid of the animals that don't work. And that is our website there at the top, greenpasturesfarm.net. And Ian and I have a school every year at our farm that's coming up uh, in May. And with that, I think I'm out of time.